Hello and welcome to this talk in the Nadal webinar series 2022. My name is Mark Schweinberger and together with Michael Hall, I'm co-directing Nadal, the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory um, in the School of Languages and Cultures at the University of Queensland in Australia. Nadal is a school-based support infrastructure for computational humanities that aims to assist anyone interested in computational or quantitative analysis of language or speech data. Ladal is also part of the Australian Text Analytics Platform, ATAP, which is an open source environment that provides researchers with tools and training for analyzing, processing, and exploring text. As such, ATAP aims to provide a powerful, customizable, as well as accessible toolset for a large number of researchers who have or who, or who have not uh, strong coding skills. Now, before we start, I'd like to read out an acknowledgement of country, which we do here in Australia, to express our respect and gratitude towards the Indigenous people of Australia. So I'd like to say that we as members of the University of Queensland acknowledge the traditional owners uh, and their custodianship of the lands from which we're broadcasting this webinar. We pay our respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. I'd also like to say that we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. If you want to know more about Ladal and the resources we provide, please feel free to explore the, the, the Ladal website. And no worries if you've missed any of our webinars, all of them are freely available on our Ladal YouTube channel. You can also find information about past and upcoming presentations in the Ladal webinar series 2022 on the events subpage of the Ladal website. If you want to keep up with what's going on at Ladal, please feel free to follow us on Twitter um, or on Facebook. And if you have any questions, suggestions or feedback, please do not hesitate to reach out to us by email. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Cédric Courtois. Cédric is Senior Lecturer in the School of Communication and Arts in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Queensland. Before joining UQ, Cédric worked in Belgium at the um, KU Leuven and was visiting scholar at the Hans Brüder Institute, which is now also the Leibniz Institute of Media Research and collaborating partner of Ladal. He's both an audience researcher and a methodologist, and his research interests include algorithmic impact uh, in digital culture and data science applications in digital media and communication research, including text mining and image processing. So I'll stop sharing here and I'll hand over to uh, Cedric. So welcome, and we're very excited to hear your talk. Thank you, Martin. Um... I'll click share and then maximize the PowerPoint. And I hope you can all see my screen right now. Does that work? Okay, yes. thank you. Yeah, so rather than having um, a polished PowerPoint and presentation, I I'm, I'm just gonna talk about an experience that um, not only myself, but a couple of colleagues of mine, um, and they're listed right here, um, Zoe McLean, um, Sebastian Kempf, and Roger Stahl from the USA, that we had the last year in digitizing um, a bit of an unexpected um, archive of documents that have to do with the interface between Hollywood, so entertainment, um, audiovisual production, and the US military. So what I'm going to talk about is our discovery process, trying to work with those documents and try to um, yeah, build a digital archive with those documents, eventually with the goal to analyze um, systematically how Hollywood and the US military, how they um, have interacted in the past decades and um, how they, um, they actually um, yeah, have uh, some uh, quid pro quos going on there. More about that later. Now, the title is, uh, is very particular here. Um, it's talking about the archive as a concept, as a subject rather than a source. So the idea is that um, archives are learning, um, sorry, living material, 
and that um, our interpretation of them is not as straightforward as it might look um, at the onset because we um, often look at archives as some kind of a dead matter, um, an objective source of truth, but the reality is quite different. And um, that reality gets even more complex when you take existing documents and existing um, collections and you try to um, digitize them and unlock them because then you add in more layers up of uh, subjectivity. Right. So the idea is that, generally speaking, um, archives are, are extremely important in humanities. I can talk for media and communication studies, and um, there I can tell you that um, there's multiple subdisciplines that just hinge on um, having access to archives. I'm talking about film and television studies. Um, they, they work with audiovisual archives, but also, um, for example, box office archives or um, cinema programs. Obviously, um, newspapers and historical um, journalism studies, they, they go back decades um, digging through um, published newspapers, magazines, and so on. But I suppose that if you look further um, than just media and comms, that um, for practically any kind of social discipline in humanities, that there is a use for archives and that there's definitely subdisciplines that make a very welcome use of resources that are available. Now, the issue with that is that um, even though archives might be available somewhere or they might be buried somewhere, um, getting access to them, that's usually already um, one of the caveats, one of the barriers we have to overcome. And if we're lucky enough to get access, then the question is in what degree or to what degree are they digitized? Because it might still be an analog um, collection of information. And um, the only way of accessing it is just digging through um, folders, digging through paper. So that digitization, sometimes it happens, maybe not fully, or uh, maybe it's still work in progress. Um, but yeah, that, that's an enormously um, labor intensive process. It's enormously costly. So um, that kind of access to digitized archives is not that widespread. And even if it's digitized, then the question is, how well is it indexed? Because um, you can have a collection of materials. They can be translated into digital documents. But then if you want to search through them or you want to get a general overview of what is in there and what is the, the quality of um, the information that is in there, you rely on indexing, as in how are these archival documents, how are they described? And moreover, is that description, is that of sufficient quality or is it riddled with mistakes? Okay, so we have archives out there, undisputed, they're available, but they're not always digitized. And if they're digitized, then the question is how well are they indexed? Costly, in time, also in, in financial resources. And there is our silver lining because uh, with the upskilling that we have in humanities in terms of um, digital computational methods, there are significant DIY opportunities. We can do things ourselves. If we get access to like a scans documents or scan documents uh, from um, archives, then we can ask ourselves in how far can we take it to make our own digital archive? And that is what my talk of today is going to be because that was a situation that, that we were confronted with. We had access or we have access to quite a substantial set of information, 27,000 pages of documents describing the interface between the US military and Hollywood. But the issue was, these documents, they are well, quite poorly scanned. That's one. There is no metadata, none, none whatsoever. And um, these documents are not yeah, that nicely formatted. So you have to imagine that these 27,000 pages, they're just, yeah, um, one big pile of information. And we have to find our way in. We have to find a way to start that indexing process to make it well described and to make it searchable through that description. So more about the case in just a bit. Now I already mentioned archives as object versus subject. Now the idea is that um, yeah, archives are bread and butter for researchers. But rather than um, yeah, a source of objective truth that is just presenting itself to us and we just have to um, yeah, 
um, start reading and then draw conclusions, there is more work to it because we have to answer a couple of fundamental questions. First of all is, okay, we have an archive or maybe just a collection of documents. In, in what context were those documents created? What is the cultural, social, political background of the creation of those documents? Because that will determine um, what kind of form those documents will take on. It will determine what kind of information can be there and information that might be omitted. And um, yeah, that goes even so far that we can talk about a politics of inclusion and exclusion. Some information is recorded for later use. Some is never recorded at all. So we have to ask a question in what context is an archive um, created, but then also as a result, how representative is it for a phenomenon that we're trying to study here? Um, is it covering the full extent or are there strategic holes in there that might alter how we can interpret it? And we're humans, even though we try to be as objective as researchers as possible. But um, our engagement with the archive will also involve interpretation of those cultural, social, and political contexts of what is included and what is excluded. So even, even before the, the digitization, we're talking about multiple layers of subjectivity that we, um, we cannot overcome that. We have to kind of embrace it and um, first of all, acknowledge that it's there and be very transparent about how exactly we interpret the collection that we're engaging with. But then suppose we have access to an analog archive or an archive of which the analog documents have been digitized. Then we have a long way to go to make it searchable and well described. So when we talk about archives, um, we talk about text, and that could be um, yeah, a wide array of, of types of text. Now, today I'll talk about um, text in terms of um, alphanumeric characters, words and sentences, uh, but it could easily be um, audio fragments. It could be um, archives of um, images or, or at least um, yeah, graphical materials. Um, and each of those types of text, they will require a, a different approach, but these steps will always be there in that we, of course, need to prepare archive materials. And depending on their age, we, we might even have to go through a whole phase of restoration. If documents have been degrading for decades, um, then their quality might be quite poor and they're not ready for immediate digitization, as in uh, make a digital image out of it or digital recording or even uh, a plain text representation. There might be some steps that have to be done in the middle or even before it. Now, the issue with restoration is that is definitely specialist work. Um, I have no idea how to um, restore um, film or how to um, yeah, um, treat a text document so um, it gets into the best shape. And luckily, we didn't have to concern ourselves with that because even though the quality of the data that we worked with was not optimal, it was still fairly okay. So we can immediately move on to the digitization phase. And digitization means, um, yeah, we're turning the analog materials into ones and zeros. Here, that meant scanning. So um, part of the archival materials that we work with have been scanned by one of our team members, Roger um, Stahl. Um, another part was obtained from um, what is called an ELO, an uh, Entertainment Liaison Office, uh, which represents um, the military. So you have, for every branch of the US military, you have um, a liaison office. Um, and it's also including not only the military, but the CIA as well. Now, um, documents were um, requested through what is called um, yeah, Freedom of Information Act um, requests, and they were scanned after that request by those offices. So part of the data that we got was already scanned. Part of the data was by going to archives and scanning it ourselves, or at least Roger did that. Okay, so then in our case, we had a whole bunch of PDFs, PDF documents um, of yeah, written text. And then, um, yeah, what you have is a document that is digital. You can open it on your computer, but, um, a computer does not interpret that as text, as in, um, well, if you have good OCR software in your scanner, then you might be able to select the text from your PDF. But the reality has shown is that um, usually that is of the poorest quality you can imagine. So basically what we have is just an image. 
So then we had to further process that with OCR, and I'll talk about that later. It stands for Optical um, Character Recognition. It's basically finding text characters in an image, translating that to computer-readable plain text. So far, it was still relatively easy. And then, then came the heavy lifting, namely the indexing. How do you turn plain text that has, at that point, no formatting in the document, um, contains mistakes because that translation, translation process is not always perfect. How do you get that into a data structure um, with the uh, known properties to us all with rows and columns? How do you make that happen? How do you organize that into variables? And that was our end goal. Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit for the ELO archive. But before I get there, I would like to turn back to the digitization process in, in more general terms by warning that um, the digitization process in itself, it tends to alter documents. So the idea usually is that if I have an archive and I digitize it, I get a perfect representation of what was already there. So if I have a whole bunch of text documents, let's say a newspaper archive, then I can use these methods, for example, optical character recognition. And what I end up with is a perfect representation of the original. Well, no, that's not true. And there's some interesting um, examples in the past, um, published examples. For example, the National Library of um, Sweden has a newspaper archive. And there were a couple of researchers, and I forgot to <laughs> include their names, but I can, uh, I can get them um, if you like. Um, they did a they had a study on um, yeah, the, the, the original documents, comparing them with the eventual scanned versions of them and the OCR inter interpreted versions of them. And it figured that, um, yeah, there were millions of misinterpretations, not only in, in characters that were misrecognized, words that were mangled up, but also in terms of um, how they were auto-segmented afterwards, so how they were chopped up into little bits and pieces that eventually then fed into the metadata of those archival materials. So what they concluded was, okay, great, we can digitize to a very certain extent and, and that's helpful, but there, there has to be um, a fundamental mistrust towards the end result because it's riddled with mistakes. It's quite okay what we have, but it's definitely not perfect. And that can have repercussions. Another example I would like to talk about is um, one on the British Mass Observation Archive, a British archive that tries to get as much documentation on everyday British um, life as possible. And they also used OCR on a whole bunch of texts. And um, that goes back decades, even centuries, if I'm not mistaken. And um, those texts, they, they, they are, to a certain extent, they're typewritten um, on a typewriter, or sometimes they are still handwritten. And now, one capability of OCR is that it works quite well with typewritten text. But if you feed it handwritten text, it performs badly because it's not designed for that. And of course, there are algorithms that, that are specifically um, oriented towards um, deciphering handwritten text. But depending on the quality and the type of handwriting, even that quality is, is quite debatable. Now, why is it important here? Because whether a document is typewritten or handwritten, historically, that makes a difference. Because what is the context of early typewritten texts? It is um, government administration, it is um, large corporations. So there is definitely a social, economic, and cultural background that uh, underlies typewritten text, whereas handwritten text is um, closer to ordinary life, to the, yeah, the life of ordinary Brits at the time. And if you then notice that the performance of typewritten text is much better, so it delivers you much more valid data than handwritten text, you actually bake in, um, disproportionately bake in a bias into your digital archive. So that's something we should at all time be aware of, because that is something that is also relevant for, for our case right here. And then, even if you have a decent quality of um, text being translated, digitized, and being turned into plain text with OCR, then our final step 
and perhaps even the most important one, is still quite challenging. Because if you have a whole bunch of text, eventually you want to turn that into those, yeah, valuable metadata into those variables that describe what um, the text is about. And here, there's also quite some opportunity to automate that and to um, yeah, use all kinds of machine learning, artificial intelligence tools to try to make that happen. But there is a looming danger there that those automatically generated um, classifications or classifications that are a priori designed, but then are um, filled up with automation, that they're ill-fitting and that they misclassify. And suppose that you are a statistical researcher working with those metadata, you've never engaged with any of the raw materials of an archive, and you just kind of assume that, um, first of all, that indexing, that it's correct. And then that that indexing, the, the variables in there, that they mean what you think they mean, well, if you do analysis with that kind of background, then yeah, the door is wide open to make all kinds of mistakes that just completely wipe away any kind of validity in your analysis. So metadata, if it's done properly, can be a massively interesting source to look at an archive in its entirety and to do all kinds of longitudinal analyses. But um, you have to be very careful because you even if you work with those quanti quantitative data, you have to ask questions about that subjectivity, as in where does the archive come from? Um, what is in there? And also what has the process of digitization meant for that archive? If you don't do that, then you're actually working blind. And um, yeah, you might end up in a heap of trouble um, when you uh, are scrutinized for the validity of your, your study. And that is something that we were very wary about. We didn't want to make any mistakes there. So we wanted to know our digital archive or even from its um, analog um, birth, we want to know exactly what we were doing. So we had to um, generate actually a narrative, a narrative on the collection. So, okay, these documents, where do they come from? What do they represent? Um, what kind of interpretation do we um, yeah, project onto these documents? And then moreover, the process of the digitization itself. So by our um, tools that we used and the methods that we employed to um, yeah, add the, the metadata to do the indexing, what kind of information was lost? What kind of sources of potential misclassification or, or, or errors were created? Um, all of that needs to be blended into a narrative that has to be part of your communication of that archive towards your audience and of every study that comes from it. That's basically the case that we, uh, we definitely wanted to make right here. All right, I've been talking for a while now. Um, what I would like to show you is a trailer, a trailer for a documentary um, produced by um, Roger Stahl and um, Sebastian Kemp. Um, and it's about ELO and Hollywood, and um, they mention um, that whole treasure trove of documents that we will then later work with. So I'll just show you the um, trailer of the documentary because it's a really nice way of setting the scene. Now I hope that the sound works. Here we go. So say you're a producer and you want to make a war film. You would walk into the entertainment liaison office in downtown Los Angeles. You say, I want to film at an Air Force base, or I want an aircraft carrier, or I want some black hole helicopters, or whatever it is. And they would tell you straight away, give us your entire script. And we've worked with Mr. Bay here since Armageddon, if I'm not mistaken, and, uh, and hope to do more of the same. I've got a direct line to the Pentagon. <laughs> Some people probably would say, well, yeah, I've heard of this, like the Top Gun, maybe Black Hawk Down, maybe some of the Marvel series. But what they don't know is how systematic this has been and how huge this operation has been. You can call it censorship, you can call it propaganda. It's, it's all of these things. Now these freedom of information requests that have been successful allow us to actually look at that list and it's stunning. What we've found is that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of products have been affected and are often rewritten at script level by the national security state in the United States. Do normal people know about that? No, of course they don't.
right. That's so. Oh, sorry. So <clears throat> the idea here is that, as mentioned in the trailer, if a production company wants to um, get certain assets from the U.S. military, they they have to launch a request, and um, with that comes the entire script. And then, depending on whether um, the ELOs like that script or uh, whether they want revisions, they will make a decision about um, supporting or rejecting support. And all of those um, interactions, they, they have been documented. And those documents are not available for the public. But um, through those um, yeah, Freedom of Information Act requests, um, Sebastian and Roger, they were able to get um, that whole treasure trove of more than 27,000 documents. Now, um, what do those documents look like? Um, well, we have a couple of pages here. Um, so here in, in the top, you, you can see um, a letter between um, Paramount Pictures and the ELO about um, Forrest Gump, because we all know that movie, that was not supported. So, so there were um, substantial concerns um, from the US military and um, that didn't receive any support. Right here, we have another type of document, which is uh, an Excel sheet that was, um, well, not delivered as an Excel sheet, but just as a, a printed document um, with an overview, a partial overview of um, yeah, productions that were supported, were um, rejected, got limited um, support. Um, so you can see that these documents, they, they have quite diverse layouts and it, it's, it's not always that straightforward to um, find um, a structure in there that you can work with. So we had to um, yeah, put our puzzle head on and, and try to figure it out ourselves. So that, that is quite a peculiar situation because usually what you have is there is a, an archive available and then you start from an archive, you, you, you digitize it. But here there was um, a wall in between so of course the ELOs are not going to tell us um, yeah, what their archives look like and we're not getting access to any of those archives. We kind of have to um, yeah, find our way in and, and, and probe certain productions, um, FOIA them, and then hope that you get uh, a positive um, response. And then based on the documents that you get, you try to look for other productions that are mentioned or that are claimed, and then you FOIA them as well. And one type of document that has been proven ex extremely helpful um, is what we call a weekly reports. So in those 27,000 pages, what is in there? We have what you call individual binders. They're um, combinations of documents that have to do with one particular production. What could be in there? It could be um, different versions of a script. It could be um, letters and faxes and emails between um, the production studio and the um, and the ELOs, or it could be internal communications within the ELOs. So those are all about a specific movie. So you can query that, you can ask for a specific movie in a FOIA request, but yeah, the only thing you get is normally that particular movie or that particular production. Now, what happened is that with some of these productions, there were um, snippets in there of what we call weekly reports. And a weekly report, well, it is what it says it is. It is an overview of all the productions that an ELO is dealing with at that particular time, at that particular week of a certain year. So once um, the team members um, yeah, realized that there is a thing like a weekly report, that became the target. Why? Because um, if you target every week, then um, you start to get structure. You start to get an overview that you can then later on fill up. So that became the target. On top of that, you have what we call the DOD, um, the um, defense ministry um, database. And then here you have one page of those and also external sources. So um, for example, we work with a book um, um, published by an author called um, Suet, um, who made an entire list of um, military teams productions. And some of them were labeled as in, yeah, we know that they got um, support from um, the US military, yes or no. So that is even more information beyond that archive that we could just blend in. All right, and, and just to show you how poor the layout and even the scan quality of some of these documents was, just one page here from, um, I think is the Navy, yeah, where you can see that, um, yeah, they're, they're not doing their best to give us the best possible quality. 
Um, some of the text is quite vague. Um, the scan quality, yeah, it, it's half rotated sometimes even. Um, and that makes it all the more difficult to um, translate that into proper digital text and then um, yeah, find a structure in it. Okay, but before we get to the actual work, um, digitizing an archive, it, it, it involves a whole bunch of strategic decisions. And um, we've listed a few here um, that we early on, even before we touched a single document, had to agree on with the whole team. And the first thing is, well, what is our objective here? And that requires thinking about an audience. And for us, the audience was fairly clear. Um, from the start on, our audience was academics, academics who have to deal with this topic. Why? Because um, in the field, there has been quite a bit of literature, but it's not based on the best empirical basis. So that was one of the challenges that we wanted to overcome here is um, yeah, provide the field with good research data. At the same time, next to your audience, you have to kind of choose your darlings here, as in what exact phenomenon are we going to address here? And that, again, was quite straightforward, um, because what we were looking for was that um, ELO decision making. So we wanted to know, first of all, what productions have requested support. And then based on that request, was that request supported or was it denied? Just a binary. Yes, supported. No, rejected. So straightforward as that, we wanted to work with that kind of objective. And that then led to translating it into a data structure because you start with the documents, but eventually you would like to have a data set with rows and columns. And there we had a few key variables that were immediately in line with the phenomenon that we wanted to address, meaning that we wanted to have titles of productions that requested support. Obviously, we want to have a date because uh, we want to make an historical analysis of this. It's not only the past few years, it's decades on end. And a decision. So yes or no, rejected, um, approved or rejected. You also have to plan from the start your quality control. Because as I mentioned, there's so many possible um, sources of noise, of mistakes, of um, yeah, junctions where it can go horribly wrong and you could completely invalidate all of your efforts. So to make sure that doesn't happen, you have to have the capacity, the human resources to do manual checks after every fundamental step in your process. And obviously that comes at a cost. And uh, we were lucky enough to get uh, support from uh, the University of Queensland. Um, so I think we received $32,000 in an, what is called an enabler grant. And that uh, allowed us to do the, the first batch of um, those documents. And then finally, transparency. Because again, um, we're looking for an audience of researchers. And if they are confronted with a data source or eventual database, then obviously they want to know, like, how did you get there? Um, what kind of steps did you do? Um, what are the difficulties there? Can I trust your data? And there it was important, uh, we discussed that early on, to always keep a link and to find a way to keep a link between the raw materials, what we started with, and the final product being that database with the variables in the rows. And also to be just as transparent and as open as possible about the limitations, because this is never going to be perfect. You start with such a mess that you can do your very best to make the final outcome as good as possible, but yeah, it will never be perfect. There will always be anomalies. It's just a matter of trying to reduce them to a maximum. All right, so then starts the work. And by the way, everything that I'm going to mention right now in terms of steps, there is code available. Um, there's a GitHub link at the end of the presentation. So for every step, we have a code snippet um, with an example. And if you want to work on your own project, you can just use these code snippets and blend them into your own yeah, full scale project. All right. So we have those 27,000 pages and they're um, dispersed among like a whole bunch of PDF documents. Some of them have um, more than a thousand pages, others maybe have 20 or 25 pages. Now we want to turn that into um, a homogeneous data set. Um, and what we need for the OCR later is a high res image. So that's our first step, translate the PDF 
every page in there to a high res image. That's, that's quite easy. Um, there's Python packages that allow you to do that. And in some case, we even had to optimize them because the algorithm that we're going to use later on, the OCR algorithm, it assumes that um, you have a white background with black text on top of it, and that there is a clear contrast between your white background and your black text. So if you have characters that um, may not be yeah, shaped properly, there is different ways of trying to optimize that. Um, for example, to, to increase that contrast or to make sure that the contours are filled up um, or to um, alternatively get rid of text bleed. So characters that bleed out and that kind of distort the shape, there's ways of fixing that. Now, luckily we didn't have to do much of optimizing because documents, even though not in the best of shape, they weren't that bad either. And then after the optimization, we went for um, the step of OCR. So translating that high resolution image to plain text. So what you have to imagine here is that, and this is one of those pages that were of um, yeah, almost perfect quality, but you can see it's a bit of a mess with bullet points all over. What we did there is from this high resolution image, you can see at the right, we used um, an OCR algorithm called um, PyTesseract. It's based on Tesseract um, that is um, originating from Google. So it's, it's quite powerful. Um, that algorithm, it takes that image, then line by line, it extracts the text from it and it writes it into a TXT file. So you can see that um, if we go a little bit down here in bullet point number three here, bus feed news, follow this Netflix, and then dash the series educates viewers on various stories. You can see that that appears here as well. And that translation is nearly perfect. You can only see that the, the bullet point here was um, interpreted as an E, which I think is just a minor inconvenience because the text that is relevant, that came out fine. You can see the quality is quite good. Now, I've shown you a different example of text that was um, of um, far less quality, and then you get more gibberish in your, um, your translation in your OCR attempt. And that's something, yeah, there's not really a way around that. Um, that's something you will have to catch or try to catch um, with your human intervention and your quality control. Now it gets even more complicated because some of these pages, they were not just running text that you can interpret line by line. Some of them um, treated us on um, tables. And um, yeah, you, ca you can't interpret a table line by line because then you, you mess up the data structure there. So what happened here, and there's also a code snippet available for that, is that I, I started, well, first of all, I did a bit of Googling as in did anyone else have um, a similar problem? And I, I stumbled on, um, I think it was a medium.com um, contribution where somebody took, um, yeah, a PDF um, generated from an Excel sheet, so in perfect quality, and then used um, the lines that are drawn in the table, so vertical and horizontal lines, and used that to identify um, yeah, the boundaries of the cell and then slice every cell and then use a text recognition algorithm on every cell. So I, I mildly adapted that um, in, in what way? Well, if you scan um, a page, then the table lines, sometimes they're not fully available in the document. So I had to find a way to extend those lines and to kind of estimate where it starts and where it ends. So the green um, horizontal lines and the red vertical lines. And then on top of that, uh, and that was a bit of a pain, um, some of our pages were rotated. Not, not a lot, just maybe a few degrees. And then it is not recognized as a horizontal or vertical line because it's actually a diagonal line. So what we did there was um, before we started slicing up the table, we, we tilted um, iteratively the document just a few degrees left to right, and then looked at um, yeah, the best possible solution in which we identified the most horizontal and vertical lines. And if that was the case, well, okay, that's what we're going to use to actually slice it up and to get the information from the cells. Now, truth be told, some tables, they were just broken beyond repair and that was just manual work. Um, yeah, 
it happens. You can only take automation so far. Sometimes there's just no way um, to make it work and to make it work validly. Um, and uh, then you have to yeah, get an RA on board or do it yourself. And uh, sometimes it just goes faster to do it manually. But if you can avoid that, then obviously you try to. And then, okay, so at that point we had a whole bunch of these um, TXT documents, so with plain text in there. The only structure that you have in that plain text document is that um, every line that is extracted from the original ends with a hard enter. So that's the kind of structure we have. The lines in the original document are also lines in the TXT document. But apart from that, there's nothing. There's nothing to go on in terms of um, formatting that is translated from the original documents to that TXT file. Luckily, they're quite clever ways of, of yeah, finding some kind of pattern in that whole mess. That's called um, regular expressions. Basically, they're um, search queries, but abstract search queries that you can apply to plain text to um, identify certain formulas or certain ways of formulating text and to drag them out. Now, that may sound a bit abstract, but let me give you an example here. So remember our target variables were date. We also like to know what type, if that available was, a, if that information was available, the text and the title. Um, and in the text, there would be information about whether um, um, uh, production was um, supported or not. So that needed a bit more work, but the information was there. So for example, here for date, if you have on the line um, a pattern, as in as of, and that would be there always for every document of that type, and then the text that we're actually interested in, 21 April, 2006. Well, we only want to get the red text here. Well, a regular expression that does that is, well, as of, open the rounded bracket, meaning that from now on, we're interested in that portion of text. And then um, we start with, yeah, just a whole bunch of characters, doesn't matter what. And it has to end with four digits. So what we have is no matter what here, 21st April in those rounded brackets, and then has to end with two, um, four digits. So two, zero, zero, six. And that two, zero, zero, six should be the end of the line. That's what the door sign means here. So basically if that kind of formula, if it pops up, then we're going to extract that date from it. And because it's abstract, it doesn't matter whether it's 21st of April 2006 or the 1st of September 2010. If it follows that formula, that red text, no matter what it is, if it ends in four digits, it will be um, identified and it will be extracted. Same thing for um, type. For example, there could be um, a letter numbering going on. So a dot, and then the type that we're interested in would be film slash TV. It could be a heading, for example. Well, here we're looking for that exact formula, film slash TV, and it has to be at the end of a line. So nothing can come after TV. If that's the case, then that's the type title that we're looking for. Here, for example, for a title, we could have a formula that says, uh, well, yeah, we have an opening um, double quotation mark then the title that we want, then a closing double quotation mark, um, a space, and then a dash. Well, in that case, we might be interested in just yeah, using those double quotations and getting everything that's in, in between here. So this regular extra, um, expression would be enough to get closing the ring, and it doesn't matter what comes after. It just doesn't matter. And by the way, that, that sign here at the beginning, that means that it should be at the beginning of a sentence. So it's not whatever comes in between quotations later on. No, no, it has to be the beginning of a line, the beginning of a sentence. And then text was whatever remained. That was quite easy. So that means that for every type of document with the variation that is there, we had to um, yeah, come up with those patterns. And even within a document, there might be variations. For example, quotations might differ. Uh, or, um, yeah, these documents are written by humans, so they make mistakes as well. Maybe they open a quotation, but they don't close one, uh, or the other way around, or they forget their dash. Well, in that case, you have to just add more patterns to it. So this is just an illustration of one of these documents, 
well, that's how we get the, the types out of it, the titles out of it, the studio, um, and, and the dates. But um, yeah, some of our documents, especially those with more than a thousand pages, that would be just a whole bunch of these patterns. Now, how do you come up with these patterns? By eyeballing. So what you need to do is basically open the original PDF, start eyeballing it and look at, okay, what patterns are in there and translate those patterns into a regular expression, then run it, see what you have. If there's something missing, then you will have to come up with an additional pattern to, well, get those variations. And sometimes there's just, yeah, titles that you lose because, um, yeah, they don't match any pattern and you just missed them as a human. You didn't see that they did not pop up in your results. But hopefully that was um, to a minimum. We did that work meticulously, or at least our RA, um, Zoe, um, spent a whole lot of time working on this. Uh, we did that together, but she did uh, most of it. I have to admit that. <laughs> All right. So then, um, yeah, we started with our original documents, translated into plain text, then used pattern matching to get the title, the date, the type, and the additional text. And the further we got to an actual data set with lines and columns, the more we thought about, okay, there must be something that we can do to further enrich those data. And yeah, when we talk about audiovisual productions, then yeah, there is one particular treasure trove out there called IMDB, the Internet Movie Database, that contains just so much information on, and that's the limitation, productions that actually made it, that got produced. So yeah, to try to figure out how far, how far we could go, um, we, we tried the matching. So for every title that we, uh, we extracted, we did um, a Google search, a Google search looking specifically in the imdb.com domain for that title. Now, why Google search and not directly IMDb? Well, um, if there was a mistake in the title, um, Google is quite good at auto-correcting entries. Um, I mean, we all use it almost every day. If you have a typo in there, Google is quite good at, at figuring out what you actually meant. And from that Google search, we, uh, we looked at the first um, result. And if that first result was actually a page that referred to a particular um, title, particular production, then we got that URL. And then we used that URL to get the IMDB ID which is a unique identifier for every production. And then eventually we um, use an API to get all that information and merge it with our original data set that we had at that point. Sounds good, but um, it was quite disheartening um, how many matches were um, yeah, invalid. So no result at all, or matches that just didn't make any sense because when you have um, yeah, decades of productions, sometimes it happens, not just sometimes, it happens a lot that um, production titles, they just pop up multiple times. So if you're looking for um, a title uh, in the 1940s and there happens to be a documentary or a movie or a series that has the same title that came later, then you will have a mismatch. That is just what happens. So all of those matches, they had to be um, eyeballed by a human um, looking at what is the match and what other information do we have in terms of when was it published or when was it produced? And um, do we have some kind of um, pointer in the text in, in those weekly um, reports that allow us to match it up with the short description on IMDb? And of course, the studios as well. If all, that, if all of that information checked out, then we could reasonably, um, yeah, assume that the match was valid. In all other cases, we just got rid of it. So that means that there is quite a bit of matching, but there's also um, yeah, um, a substantial proportion of just empty fields for um, IMDB data. But eventually we had our clean database as a result, if I'm not mistaken, um, that led to over 2,200 um, individual entries. So from those seven to, uh, 27,000 um, pages, or at least uh, quite a proportion of those, we were able to distill 2,200 um, productions, which um, yeah extends um, the status, the empirical status by um, a, a factor of 15, I believe. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there uh, were studies around that dealt with 150 titles. Well, right now there is a database that is ready um, to, uh, yeah, to 
to be used in publications that contains 2,200 or even more. And because documents are added every, every possible month, um, yeah, it will grow quite fast. Now, uh, in terms of communication, so we, we have that database, that Excel sheet, but obviously, um, yeah, you don't want to um, publish an Excel sheet and, and that's it, especially if you have more information that uh, lies underneath it. Um, so that's why we build a website. Um, still under embargo, so I can show you what it looks like, but I can't give you access right now. We hope to uh, to change that. Now, why not now? Because it's still ongoing work, and um, yeah, we are. Uh, we would like to have um, at least one publication out before we can uh, we can share it with the field. But what does the website look like? Well, you have um, a page that allows you to explore just by typing in a production title. And then um, if you go further and you click on a production title, you get all the information we have about that production title. And I hope this works. Yep, it does. So now I'm online and um, I'm going to explore the database right now that requires passwords. Nope, not now. So what you're looking at, and I'll make this a little bit bigger, is the, the entire um, table of, yeah, in this case, 2,298 um, productions. So you just type what you want. For example, um, forest. Oh. Forest gum, double R. Um, so here you can see, oh, release year 1994. It was denied and the genres are drama and romance. We click further, then you can see the production details. And there's also a link with um, the IMDb page if you would like to have more information even on top of that. Um, important is that we have um, a communication about that rejection. So if it was denied support, how did we conclude that? Well, here um, you have two pointers. It was listed in one particular document, so the DOD database. And it was also listed as denied in a book by Suet called Stars and Stripes. And if we scroll even a bit, a bit further down, you can see scans from, well, in this case, the book, where you can see Forrest Gump was denied. And if we click further, you can see that we also get the page from the DOD archive. And if we click that, we get um, an image with higher resolution so you can actually read what is going on here. That's important. Why? Because I've been arguing in, in favor of transparency. And um, yeah, we, we, we argue that there is no better way of being transparent than to show the end result, but they also show the, the original document, what that end result is based on. So even if there would be a mistake, suppose that we made a wrong call about production being supported, yes or no. As a user of this archive, you, you can look at the original document, you can look at the, the, the raw page. So if we made a, a wrong call there, or you wanna make a different judgment call, you have a different subjective um, approach to that information, then by all means, you can do that. You don't have to accept the metadata as is because you have access to the original document. Hopefully in the future, that will also allow us to get rid of as many anomalies as possible by um, yeah, working together with, uh, with colleagues who might have a, a deeper engagement with certain uh, of these, uh, these documents. Now, what else can I um, say about this? Um, yeah, so this is still work in progress. Uh, it's only based on the weekly reports. And that's something we would like to extend in the future because we have those individual binders um, with emails, with faxes, with letters, with, with scripts um, of, I think altogether maybe 500 productions that should be in there as well. So it should be um, accessible through those um, yeah, page um, or production specific pages. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, we're, kind of running low on funding right now. So hopefully we get um, some funding to continue, uh, continue this project. That leads me to concluding reflections. And I have this one quote here from Douglas in 2010, which I think was just, uh, yeah, the, the, the kind of um, 
yeah, um, rule we live by here, knowing that all archives are incomplete and we have to accept that. And they have their own biases and their basis of inclusion, definitely, omissions, point of view. And the ones that we make, well, Douglas was making another one, but that applies to us as well. Um, the ones that we make are no exception. And the yellow archive is no exception either. However, if we can create and we should create um, a counterbalance for those created by institutions and political and corporate elites, we have to do so. We have that obligation. That's exactly what we're trying to do here. We're trying to create an alternative archive through those FOIA requests and, and make that whole phenomenon of, um, yeah, uh, influence by institutions, military institutions on yeah, popular culture to make that visible and to make it analyzable for whoever is interested in it. And yes, granted, we have quality issues and we try to surpass as many as possible. Yes, the archive is incomplete. We're still, yeah, putting out more FOIA requests and sometimes they get rejected. Sometimes the quality is so heavily redacted that there is hardly any information in there. So yeah, will it ever be complete? Probably never, no. But we try to do our best here and to be as representative as possible. And another um, yeah, reality we had to face is that um, you can automate as much as you, as, as you like and you should, but um, the quality is, um, yeah, follows that. Um, you, there's an unexpected volume of manual interventions that we had to do and still have to do. So that, that eventual list of 2,200 X um, um, productions, um, I personally have run through all of them. Um, eyeballing the documents that lie behind them, the calls that have been made. And even then I noticed that there are still issues there and you, you, you just fix them as you go. And uh, I think it will still need a few runs to make sure that every piece of information is now double, triple, even quadruple checked. And there might be still anomalies at the end, but I feel that we're getting quite close to something that is, is going to lead to valid research that we can actually trust. All right, that was a lot of talking. Um, just let me remind you that the code snippets are available. So here you have my GitHub link to this particular project. The archive is available too, but for now it's under embargo, but know that this will be the URL. And if you would like to contact me later on, here's my email address. So that's uh, my talk for now. I'm gonna stop sharing. And if there's any questions, I would love to, uh, well, hopefully I can, I can give you.